Tonight on Reporting Scotland, a seismic shift in the political landscape. Scottish Labour sends 37 members of Parliament to Westminster, among them Ian, Ian Murray, at one time their sole MP, now he's Scottish Secretary. We very deliberately under-promise because we want to over-deliver in government because people for far too long have heard big, bold promises from politicians, whether that be across the UK or whether that be in Scotland. Difficult and damaging is how John Swinney describes a disastrous night for the SNP, which saw them lose 38 seats. The party now has nine. The Scottish National Party needs to uh, be healed and it needs to heal its relationship with the people of Scotland. I'll be looking at what went right, what went wrong and what might happen next with an expert panel. I'm here in Westminster where a new Labour government led by Keir Starmer is eager to get on with the job. There's lots to explore this evening, lots to analyse, but we'll also be hearing what the comedians think about last night's result. And I'm genuinely hoping, genuinely hoping that they fix the potholes because I've got a post office. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, you feel every bump. I'll second that. I don't have a hernia, but I do hope they fix the potholes. <laughs> And coming up in the sport, in an emotional night on Centre Court, Andy Murray says he wishes he could play tennis forever. Hello, I'm Sally Magnuson. Welcome to Friday's programme. Change has been the watchword today. The change in the party in power, change at number 10, change in the political landscape, both north and south of the border. It was what Sir Keir Starmer spent the campaign promising and how he's described his Labour Party's landslide victory. For the defeated Rishi Sunak, though, the language was different. Anger, disappointment and an apology to the country and his party as he resigned as Conservative leader. It was a similarly bruising result for the SNP, who have seen their carpet of yellow across Scotland reduced to a threadbare patchwork, losing 38 seats down to just nine. John Swinney says the SNP's worst election since 2010 is very, very difficult and damaging. Throughout this extended programme, we'll be running through all the results, looking at what it means to you and where things could go next. To start with, here's our chief political correspondent, Lindsay Buse. And just a warning, this report contains some flash photography. A parade of brand new Scottish Labour MPs and the man who will lead them. Today, we stop the chaos, we turn the page and we start the hard work of change. Cause for celebration as the party's stunning surge helped deliver a landslide across the UK and a platform to target victory in the next Scottish election. What does a Labour government need to do between now and the 2026 Holyrood election to enable you to get into Butte House? We very deliberately set out first steps for change. We have to deliver on those first steps. We very deliberately under-promise because we want to over-deliver in government because people for far too long have heard big, bold promises from politicians, whether that be across the UK or whether that be in Scotland, who then fail to deliver and then undermine trust in our politics. The scale of Labour's success surprised even the party's own supporters as its candidates took all six seats in Glasgow and swept away the SNP across the central belt and beyond. It's new MPs backing this man in number 10. Four nations standing together again, facing down, as we have so often in our past, the challenges of an insecure world, committed to a calm and patient rebuilding. Sir Keir Starmer will govern with a huge majority, in part at the cost of the SNP. The party had been braced for losses, but the scale of defeat was far worse than expected. High-profile figures, including Alison Thewlis and Joanna Cherry, among those to go. As dozens of seats fell away, the Westminster leader hung on in Aberdeen. That Stephen Flynn is elected to serve in the United Kingdom Parliament. Thoughts quickly turned to why SNP support went to Labour. We need to understand why that's happened. We need to learn from that. And we've got a, a pretty short time window within which to put that right and to try and restore the trust that's been lost. 
John Swinney continued the soul searching in Edinburgh this morning. Last night was an incredibly tough night for the Scottish National Party. And what does this mean for his push for a second referendum? I have to accept that we failed to convince people of the urgency of independence in this election campaign. And therefore, we need to take the time to consider and to reflect on how we deliver our commitment to independence, which remains absolute. As the SNP reassesses its future, so too do the Tories. Tonight, the Conservative Party has taken a battering the party lost hundreds of seats, including some high-profile names. The biggest name of all quitting this morning. To the country, I would like to say first and foremost, I am sorry. I have given this job my all. But you have sent a clear signal that the government of the United Kingdom must change. And yours is the only judgment that matters. Douglas Ross had already announced his plan to stand down as Scottish Tory leader, but he lost the contest for a seat at Westminster, thanks in part to reform drawing Tory votes away. Nigel Farage's party saw success across the UK, including more than 150,000 votes in Scotland. For the last four weeks since I've become the candidate, I warned that voting reform would see the SNP win here in Aberdeenshire North and Murray East. They got almost 15% of the vote and people here now have uh, an SNP MP who will agitate for independence. It was a good night for the Lib Dems, celebrating gains in Scotland and elsewhere. I said at the start of this campaign that there would be more Liberals returned to the green benches of the Parliament to come than there would be Nationalists. And we've done that and then some by a country mile. How are you all right? It's been an election of seismic change. Now Labour must prove itself in government again if it wants to see further success in 2026. Lindsay Bewes, Reporting Scotland, Glasgow. Well, Lindsay is still here with us. Lindsay, we've been using words like historic, seismic, all day, but just how would you describe the significance of this moment? Well, we thought that Labour had a very good chance of winning this election in Scotland. We thought the SNP was going to lose seats. I think what no one saw coming was the sheer scale of Labour's victory, not just that majority that they secured across the UK uh, for Sir Keir Starmer, but also the success for Scottish Labour, the number of seats they were able to take from the SNP, and subsequently the scale of the SNP's losses. It really was the surprise of the night. Now, Scottish Labour, uh, they haven't won since 2010, and previously they'd had all of these strongholds across Scotland that seemed impenetrable. They spent many years, Laura, trying to figure out how to get back to that again, and now they seem to have succeeded. Now, we'll see if this is a one-off or if they can build momentum around this success. You could say they benefited from that vote against the Conservatives, but look, this is still a big win for them and they still managed to take votes from both the SNP and the Tories last night. It's been a very different day, hasn't it? <clears throat> Excuse me, this cough is catching up with me, um, for Labour and the SNP, but where, where does this leave um, both parties, especially with the Holyrood election? Yeah. Uh, less than two years away. Yeah, the Holyrood election is going to be upon us before we know it. And there are challenges, I think, for both the SNP and for Scottish Labour here when it comes to that election, because Scottish Labour has positioned itself well with this uh, victory last night, but they really need Sir Keir Starmer to deliver something for Scotland uh, from number 10 and to deliver for those voters who perhaps support independence but lent their vote to Labour last night. They need to show that there is uh, value in being part of the union if they want to keep those votes. And the SNP, well, they have not very long to try to regroup to try to reformulate their message and to look at the things that John Swinney was talking about today, which is uh, getting on with good governance and concentrating on that and listening when it comes to their strategy on pursuing independence as well. OK, Lindsay, we'll talk to you before the end of the programme. Thank you for now. Well, let's just get a sense now of how different the political landscape of Scotland is as a result of this election. Here's our political correspondent, David Wallace Lockhart. 
This is how Scotland's electoral map looked after the 2019 election, doused in SNP yellow with limited representation from elsewhere. Today, it's a changed picture. A Labour surge in the central belt, big SNP losses. The seat of Inverness Sky in West Rosshire hasn't yet declared. There's to be a recount there tomorrow. In the densely populated central belt, it was Labour's night, taking seat after seat from the SNP, overturning some huge majorities. The whole of Glasgow went to Labour. There was a bit more success for the SNP in the North East. They held on in their two Aberdeen city seats. The SNP made some gains in Aberdeenshire, but there were still losses in this part of Scotland. As the dust settles on yesterday's election, Scots are now looking at a very different electoral landscape. What really matters is the raw numbers. Anna Sarwar's Scottish Labour now have 37 Westminster seats. The SNP, under John Swinney, are on just nine. Douglas Ross remains leader of the Scottish Tories for now, with five MPs. Alex Cole Hamilton's Scottish Lib Dems have five and could yet win tomorrow's recount. No seats for anyone else, such as the Scottish Greens, Reform or the Aleppo Party. The overall picture here is one of a swing from the SNP to Labour. Not just any swing, a big swing of around 16%. In terms of changes, that delivered 36 extra seats for Labour. The SNP are down by 38 seats. The Conservatives have lost one, a personal loss for Douglas Ross. And the Lib Dems are up by three seats. There's one seat yet to be allocated, but the narrative is clear. Scottish Labour are competitive in Scottish politics once again. Well, David is with us now. David, just how unexpected was this result? Well, in the run-up to elections, we speak to the parties about where they might do well. And seats for Labour that they won in, talking about Falkirk, Stirling, Ayr Carrick and Cumnock, they weren't even talking about those kind of seats. For the SNP, they've hit the low, uh, they've hit around nine seats. And, and there was a feeling, I think, in the party that there was a hope they could get into the teens. So perhaps slightly worse than expected there. The Scottish Conservatives, actually, against a backdrop of UK-wide annihilation really haven't done all that badly. They've only lost one seat in Scotland, but it's who lost the seat. Douglas Ross, it's always more difficult when a big, high-profile figure loses, and of course he is still, at this moment, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives. Mention as well for the Lib Dems, they've had a good night sitting on five seats. There's going to be a recount tomorrow in Inverness Sky and West Rosshire. They feel confident about that, thinking that they may need the biggest swing in Scotland in order to take that seat, and thinking that they might be able to get that really does speak volumes about how good a night they had last night. OK, David, many thanks. In the wake of the results, the First Minister, John Swinney, acknowledged that the SNP had failed to convince people of the urgency of independence. One former MP described the result as cataclysmic, while others argued the party had focused on the wrong priorities. Here's our political correspondent, Kirsten Campbell. And I declare that Maureen Burke is elected to serve in the United Kingdom Parliament, that John Grady is elected to serve in the United Kingdom Parliament, that Martin Rhodes is elected to serve in the United Kingdom Parliament. One by one, SNP constituencies fell to Labour in Glasgow and across the country, leaving former MPs dazed and unemployed. When voters were concerned about the cost of living crisis, all they were hearing was discussion about luxury camper vans and iPads. And that is the blunt reality of it. They need to know that the SNP are concerned by their day-to-day -day experiences. Um, our message did not cut through. Voters didn't give us a hearing. And I think they were probably fair to do so. Some felt voters were punishing the SNP for pursuing policies like gender reforms and highly protected marine areas. A number of policies in the Scottish Government uh, took forward in the last three or four years did not align with the people's priorities. So your fault. Nicola Sturgeon was a proven election winner. You know, this is a, at the grimmer end of expectations for... The but SNP. the party didn't win enough seats to drive forward its key aim. The failure to advance the cause of independence and the loss of focus on the public's priorities happened under her watch. And so I think she has to take her share of the blame. Um, the blame shouldn't fall all on one person, but it certainly shouldn't be at, directed entirely at those who were left holding the baby when she suddenly resigned a year and a half ago. 
There's a generation of SNP activists who've never experienced a loss on this scale because the party has won every election in Scotland since 2011, until now. But John Swinney's determined to listen and learn, hoping for a better result at the Holyrood election in two years' time. Kirsten Campbell, reporting Scotland. It was the worst performance for the UK Conservative Party in their electoral history. In Scotland, the Conservatives did win five seats, but their Scottish leader Douglas Ross failed to win in Aberdeenshire North and Murray East, with the SNP taking the seat. Our political correspondent Andrew Kerr reports, and just to warn you, there's some flashing photography. Spearheading the charge against the Conservatives in the North East. Reform UK hit the Tory vote in Aberdeenshire North and Murray East last night. Unionist, 12,513. The SNP benefited as the outgoing Scottish Conservative leader Douglas Ross was thwarted in his attempt Therefore, to return to Westminster by Nigel much. Farage's party. Well, Mr. They garnered more than five and a half thousand votes. And I have to say, in Bucky on the coast, people gave their reaction. There's been a big reform vote here. Where has that come from? I think it's disappointment and frustration with probably the major parties. I, I think it's a protest vote. The Scottish Tory leader has lost here. What's your reaction to that? Uh, Ross, no loss. How's that? Probably. They, they don't know who to trust anymore. It's being suggested locally that the support for Reform UK was a punishment for Douglas Ross and the Conservative Party for the way that David Ducat was effectively deselected from his hospital bed to prevent him from standing here. But of course, those people didn't want to lend their votes to the SNP. Douglas Ross, commiserations on losing, just your initial reaction. Yeah, obviously uh, deeply disappointed. What we knew was going to be a risk here is a reform vote was going to allow the SNP in by the back door. And I think so far this is the highest reform vote we've seen in Scotland, almost 15%. Uh, and that's a risk. Reform have been the ghosts at the feast with very little visible presence on the ground. But in a doom-laden night for the Tories, a moment of brief joy as they took Gordon and Buchan. I'm ecstatic. Um, I mean, it, it was close, but we always knew it was going to be close. I think for, for the last little while, everyone was like, oh, what's your feeling? And I was like, it's going to be less than 1,000 votes. And it was. It was about 900. Former Tory Energy Minister Andrew Bowie you, was also you, able to be returned in his uh, West uh, Aberdeenshire and Kincardine seat. Very, very long night. Back in Bucky, voters are well used to seeing political careers blossom and flourish, but candidates too are cast adrift. Andrew Kerr, reporting Scotland, Bucky. So where do the Conservatives go from here? Well, I'm joined now by the leader of the Scottish Party, Douglas Ross. A very good evening to you and thank you for joining us at the end of a, a busy day and night. Rishi Sunak said today in his first words uh, at Downing Street this morning that he was sorry. Suella Braverman also using the word sorry. I just wonder, are, are you sorry in any way today? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm sorry we didn't make more gains in Scotland. I'm delighted that the VT there showed Harriet Cross being elected and a new Scottish Conservative, Conservative MP entering Westminster along with John Cooper. They'll be joining experienced MPs Andrew Bowie, David Mundell uh, and John Lamont. But clearly our vote was down in, in many seats across the country uh, and in other seats we were squeezed. But the five Scottish Conservative MPs will be uh, a passionate and loud voice in Westminster and have contributed to a very poor night for the SNP, but I don't take anything away from my own responsibilities in Aberdeenshire North and Murray East and as leader of the Scottish Party. Do you have any regrets about that decision to stand in, in that particular seat after the deselection of David Ducat? Uh, no, I don't. I, I think we've seen with the reform vote, five and a half thousand votes, 15 percent of the, the vote share. Any candidate going in there would uh, have experienced similar challenges. So I, I tried my best. I, I fought a, a tough campaign. Uh, we were out knocking on doors. We literally spoke to thousands of voters in the four weeks since I became candidate just before the close of nomination. So, of course, things could have been and maybe should have been done differently, but I don't have any regrets. Mm, um, you were criticised from within your own party for that decision, but you also made the decision to say that you would stand down as party leader. Was that wise at that stage yeah. in the campaign? 
Well, yes, I think it was. But just to finish my, my last answer, I, I don't have any regrets. I, I think it's a, a great honour to be able to put yourself forward uh, for election to, to seek support. And sometimes you're successful, sometimes you're not. I, I was reminded by Johnny Clark, the Northern Scot newspaper yesterday, that I went into the count in 2019 with a 99% chance of losing and I won. I went into the count last night with a 99% chance of winning and I lost. And, and that's politics. And it's up to the public to decide. And uh, you know, we all put ourselves through that. Candidates be us losing candidates or, or those who are successful. Where does the party go from here? Do you, do you feel this is a low point? Well, I, I think actually a lot of the commentary you've heard, uh, certainly in Scotland, if, if we're looking at Scotland, uh, we have seen the Conservatives wiped out in Wales and I'm deeply disappointed to see good colleagues in Wales lost. And obviously uh, it's been a, a devastating result in England, but actually in, in Scotland, uh, we have held up uh, with five of our six seats returned. So Your vote share was lower though, wasn't it? 12% lower. Well, yes, but we had uh, a very specific campaign to focus on the key seats where it would be a, a choice between the Scottish Conservatives and, and the SNP. And in five of those contests, we were successful. But the wider question uh, is obviously what the UK party does with a new leader. Uh, that will be for the, the parliamentary party to look at the candidates that are put forward and then the, the wider party to look at the direction we go in. And, and I think it's really important that, that we take a bit of time. Uh, this has been a, a deeply uh, difficult election campaign and result, and I don't think we need any knee-jerk reactions that, that we may regret uh, in the short to medium term. I think it's time to look at the situation uh, and make changes uh, in, with the benefit of all of the available information rather than immediately going for a, a quick reaction. How do you reflect, though, on the loss of votes to reform? Well, we said that would be a, a key risk in this campaign. We were but why do you think that was? What do you think those voters were telling you in the process of doing that? Well, as Andrew was hearing in, in Bucky, it was a, a protest. I was certainly getting... Aberdeenshire North and Murray East, I wasn't surprised, had the highest reform vote uh, in the country. We were trying to keep that down as low as possible because the risk was it would see an SNP MP elected. But coastal communities in particular felt the Conservative government and governments and, and prime ministers hadn't done enough for the fishing industry. We've got to listen to that. I met with fishing industry leaders during the campaign and I, I heard those concerns directly from them. Uh, and some people have chosen to go to reform as a protest. It's up to the Scottish Conservatives and the UK Conservatives to win back that support. OK, Douglas Ross, many thanks for joining us tonight. As we've been hearing all day, the shift in the political landscape across the UK has been seismic, not least in Scotland. Labour have virtually swept the board here, taking a total of 37 streets. That's an increase of 36 from the last general election in 2019. It was a catastrophic night for the SNP, who've gone down to just nine seats, losing a total of 38. The Conservatives are on five seats, down one. And it was a good night for the Lib Dems in Scotland. They've gone up from two seats to five. There's just one seat left to declare in the Highlands, but votes won't be counted there until tomorrow at 10.30. Now, because this is a Westminster election, there's been a lot happening in the heart of London today, where the transfer of power took place at the usual brisk pace, as our Westminster correspondent David Porter reports. When change comes, it comes at lightning speed. Less than 15 hours after the polls closed, one Prime Minister dispatched and a new one walking up Downing Street to be greeted by cheering supporters in a highly choreographed display for the cameras. Sakia Starmer addressing the country for the first time as Prime Minister. Changing a country is not like flicking a switch. The world is now a more volatile place. This will take a while. But have no doubt that the work of change begins immediately. Have no doubt that we will rebuild Britain with wealth created in every community. Earlier, a trip to the palace to be asked by the king to form a new government. Before that, the outgoing Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, had also stood outside Downing Street. No rain this time to announce that he would resign as leader of the Conservative Party once a successor was found. And our United Kingdom is stronger too, with the Windsor framework, devolution restored in Northern Ireland, and our union strengthened. I'm proud of those achievements. I believe this country is safer, stronger, 
and more secure than it was 20 months ago. And it is more prosperous, fairer and resilient than it was in 2010. A big cause of trouble for the Tories was Reform UK. It won four seats but cost the Conservatives many more. Its leader, Nigel Farage, winning a seat at his eighth attempt. It's four weeks and three days since I decided to come out of retirement and throw my hat in the ring. I think what Reform UK has achieved in those just few short weeks is truly extraordinary. The Liberal Democrats celebrated as they campaigned with gusto. Once again, they are the third largest party at Westminster. In Whitehall, the focus on forming the new government. Those to be offered top jobs in Keir Starmer's government allowed to make the very public walk up Downing Street. Rachel Reeves will be the UK's first female chancellor. Pat McFadden becomes the most senior Scot in the government, heading up the cabinet office. And Ian Murray could barely contain a smile as it was his turn. As expected, he becomes Scottish secretary. His job to sell the new UK government's policies in Scotland and help manage relations with the SNP-led Scottish government, all with an eye on those Holyrood elections in 2026. David Porter, reporting Scotland, Westminster. For the latest from Westminster this evening, I'm joined by our political correspondent Rajdeep Sandhu. Rajdeep, what people will be keeping a close eye on now is, is what kind of relationship the Starmer government will establish with Holyrood. Well, this is certainly a seismic change in our UK politics. And what actually struck me in that speech by Keir Starmer is that he wasn't offering people unlimited hope, kind of high on the fumes of victory. He was talking, he was managing expectations, talking about how change will take time. And there is a massive amount of pressure on him to deliver what he uh, promised, which was this undefined notion of change to voters. And he's got to make sure that people can feel that their lives are getting better. But perhaps he will do in government, as he did in the campaign, to under-promise and over-deliver. We've certainly seen a stable uh, cabinet that he's appointed. He's appointed Ian Murray as Scottish Secretary, who says that he's going to reset those relationships between the Scottish and UK government and tackle poverty in Scotland. The parliament behind me is going to look very different when MPs take their seats next week. Raj Deep in a very wet Westminster. Thank you very much indeed. We've got plenty more to come in this special edition of Reporting Scotland, including the sport. Here's Sheila with more details. We'll hear from Andy Murray after an emotional night at Wimbledon. And nine Scots are confirmed in Team GB's athletic squad for the Paris Olympics. Lots more to come on this extended edition of Reporting Scotland, including the insights of our political editor, Glenn Campbell. But that's it for viewers on BBC One. We're continuing on the BBC Scotland channel, where we're with you until 8 o'clock. Here's where to find us. So, this election is not just about seats, numbers, majorities or political strategy. At its core, it's all about people the voters, choosing whom they want to represent them. And yesterday, the people spoke, as the saying goes. Well, our reporter Aileen Clark has been speaking to some today, making a journey across the central belt, where so much has now changed. A sunny start to the day at Port Seaton Harbour in East Lothian, and hope for the future. People are looking for change. Um, they're maybe a bit disgruntled, a bit fed up with what they've been having the last few years, so... It'll maybe give things a shake-up and hopefully that'll be for the better of the country, hopefully. Thomas has been a fisherman since he left school, but the cost of living is now hitting hard. Catch prawns and what card? That's about size yet. So would you like to see the government paying a bit more attention to folk like yourselves? Of course I would, yeah, for the future of the fishing industry, aye. This seat is one of the many that Labour took back from the SNP. Here is another, Bathgate, hanging baskets but closing shops. The election results, quite the talking point in this local hairdressers. We used to have about five shoe shops. There were, there's nothing like that now. You can't even go up the street now and buy a, a, a hanky, never mind anything else. I think people believe that Labour will do something this time because nothing's been done with any other parties for a long time. 
think, you know, to, to kind of change priorities away from independence, because that seems to have been the recurrent theme um, in Scotland in the last wee while, but we, they really need to get a grip of the issues that, that are facing everyone. Half an hour to the west in Airdrie, the art class is underway at the local working men's club. It and the Football Memories Group, just two of the ways, the Diamonds and the Community Charity, try to help those who could do with a hand. Mixed emotions among the volunteers here about Labour's victory locally and nationally. So I think there's a lot of people have lost faith in the SNP, so I think that's why they've went to Labour. Even though a lot of people lost faith in Labour 10 years ago, they've went back to them because it's probably the best option they think they've got. I'm feeling very sad that we've... Um Independence is now away, far away. Again, it's where it was when I was a, a wee girl, when um, we were mom, helping my mum and dad do leafleting jobs for the SNP. That's where we are now. But they are absolutely united on the need for the new government to better support the vulnerable in our communities. There's so much pressure been put on charities like ourselves and very little funding, you know, hardly any funding. And, and whoever is in charge now, they've got a big job to try and help out the third sector. With the cost of living crisis, like before, we would have been able to go and buy three kettles for 20 quid. Now we're struggling to buy one or two. Well, we've come across to the Motherwell, Wishaw and Carluke constituency, and that lovely sculpture there commemorates the Ravenscraig steel plant that once stood there. Now, of course, that was famously closed down by the Thatcher government. I think in the sports centre that stands there now, we might get a few opinions on just how decisively this latest Conservative government have been thrown from office. It's always been a working class area, so that's good news. And that will be very good news for all the people round about this area. I was very pleased that the Tories are out. That, that was my overriding uh, emotion. They're gone. Uh, I'm hopeful that Labour will, Labour will do something uh, to regain the trust in this area because there is still a lot of mistrust with Labour in this area. The challenge for the new government at Westminster. Make a difference and make it soon. Aileen Clark, Reporting Scotland, Motherwell. Well, let's unpack some of those big themes that have been emerging then and what is in store for all the winners and losers from last night. I spoke to a panel of people who've been there and done it when it comes to nights of political drama. Liz Lloyd is Nicola Sturgeon's former chief of staff. Ramsay Jones was a special advisor to David Cameron when he was in number 10. And Jim Murphy used to be a Labour MP and was leader of the party in Scotland. Jim... Keir Starmer faces a huge challenge. That's something he's admitted himself, of course. mainly with the economy. Where does he start with that task? And what do you think the change that we keep hearing about is going to look like here in Scotland? Well, I think we've seen some of the change already. We've had chaos for the last few years about ministerial reshuffles and sackings. And today's probably been the most efficient and effective appointment of a cabinet, certainly that I can remember. And I think people will reflect and say, well, that's a great start. And um, what you'll see, I think, is that a lot of these newly elected Scottish Labour MPs will find roles in, on the early stages of the government. Um, they'll be given quite important roles in Parliament and select committees. So I think you'll, see, you'll, he you'll hear a very Scottish Labour accent on a lot of the big issues. And in particular, things like bringing GB Energy to Scotland. That'll bring cheaper bills, drive renewables based in Scotland, hopefully create thousands of jobs. And on issues such as the minimum wage, getting rid of the age discrimination inside the minimum wage thresholds. So there's a, there's a really substantial progressive um, pro-employment reduction of um, poverty agenda that Labour will push. And I think it's a challenge for the SNP in particular. Do they engage with that agenda? And this is for them to work out, or whether they continue to bang the drum for independence as an alternative to that. I, personally, I'd rather they bang the drum for independence because it's, it's politics, it's, it's the politics of utter stupidity. It's the equivalent of Labour losing in 2015 and electing Corbyn. I think if the SNP take from this that what they have to do is to talk about and shout about independence ever more loudly, that's fantastic for Labour. It's, it's bad for the politics of Scotland. Um, 
and it's probably bad for the SNP, but they can make their own mistakes. Well, let's bring Liz Lloyd in. What about that messaging, first of all, on independence? Um, and also, is the man where is that mandate now that we've heard so much about now that the SNP well, have I'm lost so many seats? I'm flattered by Jim's genuine concern for the future of the <laughs> SNP. It's really touching. Um, <laughs> like, John Swinney said today, and I think it's clear to everyone, that independence isn't something which is going to move forward, certainly this side of the... Hollywood election. I actually think that's been clear to the public and to a lot of independent supporters for a long time. And that's why it wasn't a motivating factor in this election for voters, because they're not stupid. They can see it's not about to happen. So they're not rushing to the polls to vote for it. I think the SNP will engage with good policy that comes from a new UK government. There will be a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions about what exactly is GB Energy. What is it going to do? How is it going to deliver for Scotland? I think a sensible Labour government would invite the Scottish government into that discussion. Wouldn't do it to them. It would say, come on board, be on the board of this thing, help us with this thing, because actually we need to deliver here to make the UK wide energy situation work. There's a lot that can be done together, and I think the SNP will want to play that, but also look at where the shortcomings are. So, you know, from today, the two child cap is Labour's two child cap on benefits. Is that going to be removed at the budget? There will be questions and challenges about public spending, about more money for infrastructure. Is that going to come? Because what you're getting from Labour is, yeah, we're saying change, but it's incredibly cautious, incredibly slow. And we saw such a lot of disaffection last night from the electorate that I don't know how much patience they're going to have for having to wait four or five years for things to get better. Yeah, Ramsey, you're nodding your head, but you have been there when things are new, when things are starting. What, what will be going on as this new government tries to form, tries to, to take on these challenges, gets to know the civil service and try to get things working? It is an absolute whirlwind. Now, you know, there'll be a lot of people watching this, a lot of people in the BBC and politicians now are absolutely exhausted after being up all night. Remember, the people who've walked into Downing Street today, they've done that and more for the last six weeks. But right now, the adrenaline will be pumping through them. But it is evident already that there's been a remarkably slick, well-prepared operation, the choreography of the new you know, um, cabinet arriving every 30 seconds up Downing Street. Sugri and others undoubtedly have a plan ready to roll out. But actually, this was the easy bit for Labour. This was the easy bit. The hard bit, having won two thirds of the seats on one third of the votes on a 60% turnout, with a Prime Minister with a minus 18 approval rating and a public demanding change, because that's what they were told. The hard bit is still to come. And I think in Keir Starmer's speech today, he knows that because he gave the best speech of his career so far, because I think, boom, it hit him. Now I have to inspire and he has to deliver or it could be a short premiership. Mm. Just quickly, Jim, because you've been there. You were a newbie back in 1997. I was. How would you be advising all these new MPs? Don't be in a rush. It's a marathon. If you're lucky, it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> Don't always do what you're told by the whips. Um, sorry, Ram. Don't rebel. always do what you're told by the whips. <laughs> Enjoy it. Yeah. Try and make your mark. And I think the, the other thing would be decide early what your priorities are and stick to them. Don't be dictated by the latest social media fad or zeitgeist or your inbox. Um, go out and make an impact on the things that you really care about and never forget your constituents. Because ultimately, you can't do anything at Westminster unless your constituents continue to give you consent. And get lucky now and then. Yes, <laughs> every day. Well, you are lucky to be there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all very Thank much you. indeed. Jim Murphy, Ramsey Jones and Liz Lloyd, many thanks. Well, amid all the political emotions that were building up yesterday, there was the little matter of Wimbledon and, of course, Andy Murray. Yes, that was emotional. Emotions, all the emotions yeah. there. Not a dry eye in the house. And I have to admit, I was bubbling myself were you? a good bit too. I certainly was. Yes. Hello there. Andy Murray said he wished he could play tennis forever as he was honoured on centre court in one of the final moments of his Wimbledon career. The two-time champion was given a hero's reception as he played in the men's doubles alongside his brother Jamie in what will be his last year at the tournament. At the scene of some of his biggest triumphs, Andy Murray began the long goodbye in front of an adoring crowd. Seven years since his hip first began to be a serious problem, the 37-year-old reluctantly accepted his body can no longer cope with the rigours of professional tennis. 
I would love to keep playing, but I can't. Um, you know, physically, it's just it, it's too too tough now. You know, all of the injuries have, you know, they've added up, and like I said, they, they haven't been insignificant. But yeah, I, I, I want to play forever. I love I love the sport. Here they come. Recent surgery ruled Murray out of making one last singles appearance, but it felt fitting he partnered with his brother in a Grand Slam for the first time. And although the competitive spirit was still there to see, the result, for once, felt secondary. After the straight sets defeat, a montage of Murray's career highlights was played with tributes from Novak Djokovic, Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal. And it's been incredible to be a part of some of the, the matches and major championships um, with them over the, over the years. And, yeah, I was fortunate to, to manage to get through them, you know, a couple of couple of times and big moments. But, um, yeah, what a time to, to be, be on the tour, yeah. It's a career that's yielded three Grand Slam titles, two Olympic golds, a Davis Cup and a world number one ranking. And he admits he couldn't have done it without the support of his team and his family. It's obviously been hard for all of us. The injuries have been you know, tough, quite, you know, quite significant um, injuries. And, yeah, we've, we've worked extremely hard just, just to be on the court competing, probably not at the level that any of us wanted, um, but we tried. It was a night of tears, cheers and celebration as Centre Court paid tribute to one of their favourite sons. It's not the end just yet, Murray is set to join up with Emma Raducanu for the mixed doubles before he retires at the Paris Olympics. OK, sticking with the Olympics, and Jake Whiteman and Eilish McColgan are among nine Scots who have been named in Team GB's athletic squad for Paris. Whiteman has been given a discretionary pick for the 800 metres after sitting out the British trials due to a calf problem. And Eilish McColgan has been chosen to run the 10,000 metres despite a season troubled by injury. Other Scots in the lineup include Laura Muir, who will race the women's 1500 metres in Paris. The 31 year old won silver in Tokyo behind two time champion and world record holder Faith Kipyagon, but downplayed her chances of going one better. It's all about Paris and, and being the best I can there. So, uh, but no, I'm very happy with the training, training's at. And yeah, we just didn't quite show it at the weekend there at the trials, but I, I know everything's been going really well behind the scenes and it's excited to show the form that I'm in in Paris. Second in Tokyo, what chance of going one better in Paris? I'm not, I'm not sure about going one better. We have the world record holder at the moment um, competing in the event, so the best we've ever had. So that would be incredibly tough. But um, in the 1500, I think it's so unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen. So, yeah, I'm just going to run as best I can on the day. Um, and we'll see where that gets me. To rugby now, and Glasgow Warriors centre Stafford McDowell said he was overwhelmed to be named as Scotland co-captain alongside Edinburgh flanker Luke Crosby for this weekend's opening summer tour match against Canada. It will be only a third Scotland appearance for McDowell, who won his first cap in 2023 and made his Six Nations debut against Ireland in Dublin earlier this year. Gregor told me um, when we first came into camp uh, last week, he told me and Crosby together um, that we'd be co-captaining. So, yeah, it was, um, it was a bit of a shock. Um, but, yeah, I was a bit overwhelmed. I just got straight on the phone to my dad and, and told him and uh, he's actually coming into the game on Saturday. So, yeah, it's, it's obviously a pretty a special day for my family and stuff as well. So, um, he's obviously played such a massive role in my career that I'm, I'm glad I get to share that day with him as well. OK, so rugby tomorrow night. Hopefully we'll see Andy Murray and Emma Raducanu at some point as well. Another chance for a wee greet, Sheila. Yes, another wee greet, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <well>. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed. OK, back to the big story, the election. Although we know most of the picture, not all of it is written yet. There's going to be a recount in the Inverness, Sky and Wester Rosher seat, which will be held at 10.30 tomorrow morning. It's due to a statistical issue. After spending all night waiting on a result, Ian McInnes sent this report this morning as the news was confirmed. 
Well, quite remarkable scenes here in Dingwall as the morning progressed. We thought we were going to get the result of the count for Inverness Sky and West Rothshire just before seven o'clock. But then we were told about a statistical issue, which meant that the number of votes that had been verified and the number of votes that had been counted didn't match. We then went to a recount. That took over two hours. And at the end of that, we've just had word from the returning officer that they still weren't happy with the outcome of that ballot. It appears that there is still a statistical issue with those numbers. The returning officer says that he can't declare a result in this seat and uh, the candidates and their agents as well as the counters have been asked to return here to Dingwall at half past ten tomorrow for a further recount. So really quite an unprecedented situation that's happened here this morning, although it doesn't appear that it would influence the result. We have had word from Drew Henry's team of the SNP saying that the ballots look very, very good for Angus MacDonald of the Lib Dems and he's very confident that he will win this seat following that recount tomorrow. But really quite amazing scenes through the morning here. Thank you. That's Ian McInnes there. In fact, there's some breaking news in the last few minutes. The SNP candidate Drew Henry has issued a statement officially conceding the seat. He also said he wouldn't be at the recount tomorrow because of a prior commitment. We'll have more on this news later on in the programme. Now, our political editor, Glenn Campbell, has been monitoring developments for us in Westminster. When I spoke to him earlier, I asked him to assess the scale of what Labour's achieved in Scotland. Well, remember, Labour's been out of power in Scotland since 2007, and they haven't won a national election in Scotland since 2010, when Gordon Brown was in charge. So winning again is something we suspected they were on course to do at this election after their stunning win in the Rutherglen and Hamilton West by-election and now they've proven that they can win by sweeping the SNP out of the central belt in Scotland, finishing as the first place party and helping UK Labour under Sir Keir Starmer win power uh, in the United Kingdom, although he would still be Prime Minister even if Labour hadn't had this resurgence in Scotland. That's an argument that the SNP tried to deploy in the election campaign without success. The SNP put independence on page one, line one of their manifesto, as they promised to do, but it hasn't been the deciding issue in this uh, election, has it? What's been going on there? They certainly talked about it, as did uh, their most unionist opponents in the Conservative Party, but I don't think it would be fair to say that independence was a defining issue in this campaign. And it seems that many voters, including many who have stuck with the SNP in the decade since the independence referendum, saw the 2024 campaign as an opportunity to deliver change, but saw Labour and Sir Keir Starmer as a better route to that political change than the SNP. The theme, Glenn, that seems to unite what's happened to both the Conservatives south of the border and the SNP is the public hunger, sort of ache for competence in government, which used, in fact, to be the, the SNP's strong suit. Well, both the parties of power in Scotland have been punished at this election. Most definitely the SNP and, to a lesser extent, the Conservatives, who, remember, have lost their party leader, albeit that Douglas Ross said he would stand down from that role uh, after the general election. He has an insurance policy, is still a member of the Scottish Parliament, although perhaps has lost a bit of credibility in that role because he made clear he was quite happy to give it up had he been elected to Westminster. When it comes to the SNP, it can be said, I think, that their new leader, John Swinney, has stabilised things a bit in his short time in charge of the party. And it may be because an election was called so soon after he took over from Hamza Youssef, who had barely been in charge for a year, that he manages to avoid significant blame for what has happened here. There are certainly uh, no loud calls for him to step aside. So it may be that his party decides to let him pick up the pieces and try to rebuild ahead 
of the next election, which is just a couple of years away, and that's the big Holyrood campaign where Labour now see an opportunity to challenge the SNP for power in devolved government. But in the meantime, of course, Labour has pledged to deliver a better relationship between Westminster and Holyrood. I, I wonder how easy you think that's going to be. Yeah, it's not just a, a change of Prime Minister, it's a change of priorities, in some cases a change of policy. And Sir Keir Starmer uh, taking over and stepping into Number 10 for the first time as Prime Minister made clear that he wants to govern for the whole of the United Kingdom for the four nations. And in the campaign, Labour said they would try to reset the relationship between the government here at Westminster and the government at Holyrood. Now, that might be easier to promise than to actually deliver, given that Labour has given the SNP such a drubbing in Scotland at this election. Of course, they also inherit an economic reality that is very, very difficult. Uh, they are prioritising economic growth as a way to try and uh, recover the economic position after all the COVID expenditure, uh, the uh, problems caused by the war in Ukraine and the knock-on effects of that disastrous mini-budget under Liz Truss. But that means, uh, as the new Chancellor Rachel Reeves herself said, that there's not much money around and some difficult decisions are going to have to be taken. That could mean that any honeymoon period that Labour might enjoy is shorter than it otherwise would be. And if you're the leader of the Scottish Labour Party, Anna Sarwar, you want that to last as long as possible if you are to have a serious chance at challenging the SNP for power at Holyrood. Glenn, thank you very much for giving us your insights this evening from Westminster. Well, after a long campaign, a long night, and for most of our politicians, a long and emotional day, I reckon we could all do with some light relief. Sarah McMullen has been speaking to the panel of the BBC Scotland satirical show Breaking the News to see what new material is on the horizon for them as a new government takes shape. So, guys, to get us started, just tell me how we feel about those election results this morning. I think that... We knew that the Tories were going to get a kicking. Um, it has been glorious watching that. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, Fair picked up the side effects of my chemo. I even stopped vomiting for a moment. And um, I didn't expect the SNP to take such a hammer. I knew that they were going to get hammered. But, you know, as they always say, lessons will be learned. Because mm -hmm. you're a very vocal supporter yes. of the SNP, Jane. Yes. So do you think, what, what about John Spinney this morning? Do you think he'll need a weekend away? I think he's going to have to, <laughs> I think he's going to have to hire a hot tub <laughs> and just lie in it while he eats lasagna to get over this whole situation. What an image that That's is. That's a great image. I think the SNP really have taken their eye off the ball completely. Everybody was too busy arguing about gender issues while everybody was falling into potholes. And then we had Humza, who is the unfunniest, joyless man. This is a man who fell off a scooter and got upset and steady laughing. <laughs> I mean, why would you not laugh if he fell off a scooter? And then, of course, John Swinney, who looks like that stepdad who's trying to please us all really quickly, with his hot tub and his lasagna. <laughs> and Des, what did you make of the, the campaign then? Do you think it's been particularly engaging for people? Yeah, there was a, a bit of low turnout in this, maybe a lack of engagement for some, but it's an important election. It's just been weird for us because there's certain things we couldn't say throughout, and now it is just hell for leather <laughs> after every I single person. Yeah, well, this is, I sit in the middle here, so I'm able to have a go at yeah. a lot of different people. So for me, seeing new people getting elected is quite good because it gives us new targets right. and we'll finally see if Keir Starmer has a personality because he's not really done or said much to give away that too far. I want, so. to, I want to see him with a pair of inline skates <laughs> with a cap. I think, I think that the thing is it's a really weird dichotomy for me because I was desperate for Labour to win in England desperate for it but was did not want Labour to win in Scotland and that's a weird political you know, mm -hmm. can out sit on. I'm like, you guys win, no here though, win there. I'm really happy that, I mean, seeing Jacob Rees Mogg losing his seat mm -hmm. was, other than giving birth to Ashley and finally getting her out, seeing him get out 
was almost on par. Mm -hmm. I think he'll have to go into a full-time job as a Cluedo piece now. Yeah. I think that's all that's left for. I think that she's... <laughs> I, think, I think Labour, we were obviously hoping that, you know, Labour would win as big as they did. But I do feel like, and I felt this like for a while that they were like the safety boyfriend you know that guy that you meet when you're like if we're both single at 30 then mm. we're going to get married yeah. Yeah. so it does feel like it's kind of tough to know where labor stands on a lot of stuff so that i think is the next challenge and no one's <laughs> given a thought for the outgoing prime minister poor rishi sunak where, what is he going to do he's joining a tap dancing <laughs> troupe <laughs> i made a voice over this morning i actually did the tap dancing with a spoon and i did him tap dancing all the way out so he's joining a tap team can you believe his wife finally broke out a brawly like two weeks too late margaret <laughs> so guys i'm picking up from all of you that you've not maybe thought particularly much of some of the candidates have maybe bored you a bit but has the has the campaign then given you much material and i'm pleased that the lib dem have like sort of gain some I, it would have been great if they could have been the official opposition mm -hmm. that would have been that would have been really great um just to see uh the tories relegated to the back forever lounging around on the unused ppe so um but but it if ed davey did go full it's a knockout well, didn't he it was that was fun so it was fun seeing him just kind of like do personality stuff because they were like we don't think we're going to win but we want to show people that um you know, in our manifesto, we've got some good ideas. You know. I can't wait for the first scandal. I'm just all about the scandal. I don't know. I want it to be good. I want, I want some really good scandals to come up. And the other wonderful thing is, is the whole thing of reform. Now they actually have to do a job. And the very thought of all the pensioners and Clacton turning up going, son, I've not got the right bin. I think what's happened in this election, we've seen more independent people coming through and smaller parties getting the votes. So that for us is good. It's more mm -hmm. material, more people to talk about, more new mm -hmm. people, more new candidates. And I think if I was to pick a, a star, an MVP of the campaign, it would be Ed Davey. Oh, Ed Davey. Yeah. I That's think so that really. guy's just had the most fun over the past six weeks. It looks <laughs> like he's been on one giant stag do. I don't think he even knew there was an election on no. and at the end of it he's taken the Lib Dems to the best result in 100 yep. years and won his Duke of Edinburgh <laughs> <laughs> What is the hope for the future going forward? Well I hope there's a place for comedy and I hope there's a place for satire because I think for us we like to bring a bit of lightness to the dark and to hold those people to account so yeah. hopefully there's more of that and they keep giving us as much material mm -hmm. as possible and I'm genuinely hoping genuinely hoping that they fix the potholes because I've got a post office of hernia. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, you feel every bump. I'll second that. Have a great show. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you can catch that Breaking the News election special on BBC Radio Scotland at half past 11 tomorrow morning and it will be available on BBC Sounds after. Well, let's get a slightly more serious final thought from Lindsay, our chief political correspondent. That um, statement, first of all, from the SNP's Drew Hendry conceding the seat of Inverness, Sky and uh, West Rossshire, that's a victory for the Lib Dems? Yes, it is. Yes, that seat had been due to go for another recount. Uh, Drew Hendry releasing a statement saying that he had an immovable commitment and he was now conceding that seat that will now go to the Lib Dems, their candidate Angus Macdonald there. Drew Henry saying it had been an absolute joy to represent his constituents in a statement that he uh, released earlier. Uh, the Lib Dems that now takes their tally of seats in Scotland to six. They had hoped to get that extra seat. Uh, they are very pleased with how they have done in this election. They are very targeted in terms of the seats that they go after and they achieved uh, all of those targets this time around. And those Scottish seats as well, well they uh, contribute to that record total for uh, the Lib Dems at Westminster now moving into third place. Uh, uh, in front of the SNP as the, the third largest party at Westminster. Now, it's Sally. significant also that that used to be Charlie Kennedy's uh, Absolutely. Old seat, of course, the, uh, the Lib Dem leader. We've, we've talked a lot about uh, Labour and SNP this evening, but there were, there were gains and there were losses and personal triumphs and tragedies for the Conservatives, Douglas Ross uh, in particular, and more happily, um, the Lib Dems in general. 
Yeah, that's right. The Conservatives began uh, last night not knowing if they were going to lose all of their seats or perhaps add to their seats in Scotland. Uh, that was the position they were in. Such was the knife edge that they felt those constituencies were on. In the end, they took five seats. They did have six, so they lost one. It was just that the one that they lost was particularly personally significant because it was for their leader. But contrast that with the position of the Conservatives south of the border. It does now leave a lot of questions, I think, for the Scottish Conservatives as they look for a new leader when Douglas Ross stands down. And they look as well to see what happens uh, with the Conservative Party at Westminster and which direction they decide to move in politically. The new component this time was Reform UK. How would you assess its impact? Well, Reform UK got four seats. That was perhaps more than people thought than the party necessarily would. And they took a significant number of votes from the Conservatives. It was interesting to see the impact they had in Scotland because they hadn't really run a particularly high profile campaign in Scotland. They hadn't really been factored into discussions around the uh, election campaign, but they, their vote share did affect that seat that Douglas Ross was going after. If uh, those votes hadn't gone to reform and they had gone to Douglas Ross instead, and obviously there is a big if there, then Douglas Ross could have won that seat. Now, he pointed out that that seat contains the, the highest uh, support for Brexit in Scotland. Was that a factor in those votes going to reform? Nevertheless, they did get 7% of the vote share in Scotland. That's 165,000 votes. I think it will be very interesting to see if when we have the Holyrood elections in less than two years time, reform decide to stand candidates in that election. It's, um, it's interesting today, people uh, always reach for metaphors on these occasions and today it's all about earthquakes seismic, tsunamis. Yeah. Um, where, in your words, does Scotland stand today? Well, here's another one for you, Sally. I think today was proof that no political party can defy political gravity. Look at what happened to the Conservatives. Look at what happened to the SNP. Politics tends to move in phases and we're entering a new phase of politics here in Scotland. The big questions that we're looking at immediately, what will a Labour government do across the UK, but also here in Scotland? How will that government uh, work with the Scottish government? How will those relationships operate across the border? That is going to set the scene, set the landscape, the atmosphere uh, for what our politics looks like as we go into that uh, next Hollywood election, which is going to be upon us before we know it, I think. <laughs> Indeed, in the meantime, an early bed for you, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lindsay Views. It's time now for the weather forecast. Here's Gillian Smart. Hello. No real sign of the weather settling down as we head into the weekend. Today we've had a bit more in the way of brightness, but uh, still some large areas of cloud and still a scattering of showers. And tonight, those showers merging to something heavier and more persistent across northeast Scotland in particular. We have a yellow warning from the Met Office for heavy rain. That's valid 10pm through until 10am tomorrow because you can see that heavy rain developing, it will be persistent and it will lead to really poor road conditions. We're looking at 20 to 30 millimetres of rainfall widely, up to 50 in places, so that could well lead to some issues with flooding. Further south across the country, it's largely dry with some clear spells and turning quite chilly under those clear skies, we could see lows 5 or 6 Celsius. Into tomorrow, we'll start with the best of the morning brightness for central and southern Scotland. That persistent and heavy rain still in the northeast, working its way slowly southwards, and it does fragment, so turning more showery come the afternoon, but plenty of cloud across the country. Sunshine at a premium, I think. This is a snapshot around about three o'clock, and you can see lots of showers across central and southern Scotland. Some of them heavy, could be the odd rumble of thunder. And still that persistent rain affecting northeast Scotland, heavy at times. Bit more in the way of brightness perhaps for the Western Isles and the Northwest Highlands, but a cool feel. The wind's not particularly strong, but from that cool north northwesterly direction. So for some in the north, only about 12 or 13 Celsius. It's looking like a pretty wet affair across the hills tomorrow. Showers and some longer spells of rain, and there will be that risk of thunder and lightning in the heaviest of those downpours. A chilly feel as well, five or six Celsius the highs across the tops, with that cool north to northwest 
westerly breeze adding to the chill. Still plenty of showers to come at first tomorrow evening and then they start to pull away. You can see skies clearing from the west and actually as we start the day on Sunday a decent amount of dry weather thanks to a little ridge of high pressure but we have this little feature to the south of us set to bring some showery outbreaks so we'll start largely dry and bright with sunshine but cloud building as the day goes on showers developing again some of them will be heavy there will be that risk of thunder especially across southern Scotland into the afternoon still quite a cool feel temperatures only about 17 celsius at best and into next week, there'll be some bright and sunny spells, also some rain at times, and still on the cool side. That's the forecast. Thanks very much, Gillian. Now, tonight's main news again. Change as a seismic shift in the political landscape sees Labour return 37 members of Parliament from Scotland. Edinburgh South MP Ian Murray is the new Scottish Secretary. The SNP leader John Swinney has described the election as difficult and damaging for his party. They lost 38 seats, leaving them with a total of nine. Douglas Ross, the Scottish Conservative leader, failed in his bid to take a seat in Aberdeenshire. But the Liberal Democrats are celebrating a record UK win, returning a likely six MPs from Scotland after the SNP conceded the last seat still to be counted. And that's it from this extended edition of Reporting Scotland. Yep, I will be back here with your late news though around half past ten tonight. But until then, from everyone in the team, do enjoy your evening. We'll leave you with some of the highlights from the past 24 hours in what's been a monumental general election. We did it! To the country, I would like to say first and foremost, I am sorry.